so everyone, my name is Danny Nirenberg. I am the president and co-founder with Bernie Pollock of Food Tank. For those of you who don't know, but I think many of you who are joining do, Food Tank is a research and advocacy organization devoted to storytelling that highlights how food can be the solution to some of our most pressing environmental and social problems. We hope to inspire, motivate, and activate positive transformation and how we produce and consume food. I wanna thank you all for joining our special webinar about the 2023 Farm Bill. We will dive into the conversation very soon, uh, but before we do, I want to share that on June 20th, Food Tank will be in Boston with the White House Office of Public Engagement and the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy at Tufts University for our summit entitled Advancing Food as Medicine Approaches. We're really excited about it. We have a great lineup of speakers who will light opportunities to integrate nutrition and health and improve food and nutrition security research to support the implement, sorry, to support the implementation of the Biden-Harris administration's national strategy on hunger, nutrition, and health. If you're in Boston, we hope that you will join us. Uh, you can email me at danielle at foodtank.com for more details on how to register if you have problems with the code, which is food is medicine. So very easy to understand. Uh, and and um, we hope again that you'll join us. If you can't join us in person uh, in Boston, the event will be live streamed at foodtank.com and on our YouTube channel. I also wanna encourage everyone who is not already a member of Food Tank to consider uh, becoming a member. It's really important for us to be able to put on um, you know, the, the, the White House event, the, the event you're going to watch today. So please go to foodtank.com slash join if you are moved to, to help us support the, the kind of work that you're seeing today. It's because of our members that we can do this. And we really appreciate the support and hope um, that, you know, you'll, you'll consider becoming a member and encouraging your friends and family to become members as well. Um, and again, super grateful for those of you who are already uh, members of Food Tank. So now I, I just want to dive into this discussion about the Farm Bill. For just some background, the Farm Bill is renewed uh, roughly once every five years. That depends on a lot of things like who's in office and how long it takes. Sometimes, uh, as uh, I've been told, it, if it takes a little bit longer, that can be a good thing. Um, it is the largest piece of legislation in government that funds the, the country's food and agriculture systems. It covers quite a lot of different components, which we will talk about today, of how we produce and consume food both across the United States and also has international implications. In May, the Congressional Budget Office projected that this year's Farm Bill will cost roughly $1.5 trillion over the next 10 years, making it the most expensive Farm Bill in the history of the United States. More than three quarters of the spending in the Farm Bill goes toward nutrition programs, including the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance uh, Program, or SNAP, and much of the remaining 20 or so uh, percent of funds goes to crop insurance, commodity crops, and conservation, and together they really represent the, the big four. Uh, it also covers credit for producers, rural development, forestry, research, and a lot of other issues that, again, we'll, we'll get into some of them today. Um, the Farm Bill is, is important for lots of different reasons because it connects our food and farming systems, our energy use, and our stewardship of our natural resources. It can be used to help improve resilience in the face of the climate crisis, support local producers, and hopefully revitalize uh, both rural, urban, and suburban communities, as well as protect the environment. But the Farm Bill, as I've heard many others say over the years, is the most important piece of legislation that no one knows about. So we're trying to correct that problem today. Um, the current legislation is set to expire on September 30th, this, uh, 30th of this year, and conversations and controversy around the 2023 Farm Bill are actively underway. We've already heard from uh, a couple of members of Congress who are working to rethink and re-envision it, including Shelley Pingree, uh, from Maine, who introduced the Agricultural Resilience Act to achieve net zero emissions in the U.S. by 2040. And we've heard from Representative uh, Blumenauer of Oregon, who recently reintroduced the Food and Farm Act um, to, you know, as sort of a, an alternative to the current farm bill um, to ensure that we prioritize as a food system that is equitable, uh, ensures access uh, to healthy, affordable food, and invests in communities that are most in need. 
Uh, by June night, the members of the House uh, will need to submit their priorities and input for the legislation if they haven't already. So that's just a few days from now. So I, I, I do want to dive right in. We have a really wonderful group of panelists who are experts on this issue who are joining us for the conversation. Uh, I hope you will all just remain on mute until Q&A because this uh, conversation will also be part of our podcast, Food Talk with Danny Nierenberg. So please take a, a a moment to name yourself in Zoom so that we can easily call on you in a little bit. Uh, so I am just going to go ahead and introduce our panelists. First, I get to introduce Marion Nessel, an author, nutritionist, and professor at Emerita at New York University. Um, we're joined by Kathleen Merrigan, who is a professor of sustainable food systems and the executive director of the Sweetie Center for Sustainable Food Systems at Arizona State University. We have Adrian Lipscomb, a chef, and founder of the 40 Acres Project. Jennifer Auten is an associate professor in the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences at the University of Washington and a faculty researcher with the, the University Center for Public Health Nutrition. And we have Ben Thomas, who is the Senior Policy Director for Agriculture at the Environmental Defense Fund. And Ben, you should know that the Environmental Defense Fund gave me my very first internship for better or for worse. So I, I owe a lot to, to EDF for the great work that you've been doing. So Marion, I always start with you. Um, and I, I just want to do that again. <laughs> um, last year, as Farm Bill conversations were beginning, you wrote that reforming the Farm Bill is badly needed, but won't be easy for reasons of history and politics. So give me in your sort of 30 second to a minute overview of the history of the Farm Bill. Go. <laughs> that was an understatement. Um, the, the, and I should say that in an act of hubris, I tried to teach a class on the Farm Bill that was a disaster. And it ended up with my writing an article for Politico uh, that was titled, The Farm Bill Drove Me Crazy, <laughs> <laughs> which it absolutely did. Uh, it's a very big bill with um, thousands of pages of hundreds of programs, a thousand pages, um, trillions of dollars, and a weird mixture of, uh, the, of food assistance, which takes up three quarters of it, and the remaining quarter for agricultural support that mainly goes for corn and soybeans and ethanol. Um, historically, you can work at the margins. There are little, one strategy has been to get little teeny programs in that are rounding errors in the, in the amount of money involved and hope that over time those will grow into much larger programs. That has worked in some ways, that, but not others. Mm -hmm. But what there isn't and what I think is badly lacking is an overall overview that that says what we really need in this country is an agricultural policy that supports health and supports environmental uh, protection. And without that, the Farm Bill is still going to be a mess and very, very difficult to deal with. It is very messy, and I understand it, it's driven me a little bit crazy uh, over the years as well. Adrian, this is your first Farm Bill, and I wonder, one, is it driving you crazy? And two, what your comments are on Marion's um, suggestion that there's a need for a, a, an overview of, of what the Farm Bill can do to protect, you know, human health and, and the environment. Where does food justice fit into that? Yes and yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, as my first Farm Bill, is it driving me crazy? Yes, I have thought many times of if I what if we just clear the slate and start over again? Um, and I know that I'm probably not the only person that thought that and, and just thought maybe we'd end up in the same place that we are again, uh, just because of where we are. But I also thought about um, what if we, uh, what if we took some people not to be involved in the farm bill, what would that look like, right? And then how and and how do we bring humanity back into the farm bill, right? Sure. Um, hands down, um, again, this is about food. It is about humanity. It's about feeding people, but it's also about our health and our earth and making sure that we survive. So uh, sustainability as well. Um, every facet of what the farm bill 
Farm Bill is doing is touching everyone. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's, it's important. And so how do you bring that all together, that it makes a common sense and a balance uh, to, to be equitable across the board? Because as you can see for many, many Farm Bills, there's people missing, um, that there's voices missing from this farm bill, um, that it really does affect when it gets to the bottom line, when it trickles down to from the immigration worker uh, to black and brown farmers to the small, medium-sized farms. We have a lot of people in which this bill is uh, that affects, but their voices are not being heard. Absolutely. Thank you for pointing that out. Lots of folks are missing from the farm bill conversation. And so my next question is a, a question for you all. There are big concerns, as there have been in every farm bill that I've noticed, um, that you, you know the it the bill itself does relatively little to to serve the needs of any group other than big ag or big food. And one, do you think that's the case? And I know some of you have opinions on that. And that can we envision a farm bill? that does more for human and planetary health and justice. And Ben is nodding, so I'm gonna to go to him. I'll just say uh, uh, very quickly, as I shared before, I'm from a, a small uh, a farm community in the Texas Panhandle, a uh, very diversified operation in a community of diversified operations, uh, a small, medium, and large size. All of those farms um, see opportunity in the farm bill criticisms as well um, and, and ideas on how policy can be improved, uh, but there are a number of programs um, that support operations of all size and, and other um, um, aspects of rural economies that are important. Um, we see funding for farmers markets, which the public cares about and producers care about as an opportunity and as something that society wants and benefits from its rural health, its rural broadband, its rural um, uh, 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 access. So there are a number of things that I think the farm bill addresses uh, that that we um, that we could um, should be applauding, lifting up, celebrating, and building upon. Um, that's that's not to say that there are um, um, there are uh, you know maybe over investments in some places or 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 maybe um, a misdirection of of ideas um, into policies that don't really advance them. Um, um, and so let's have that discussion, uh, but it is a, um, a, a broader um, interest bill. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Kathleen, I know you have opinions on this. I'd love to hear them. I have opinions on everything, Danny. <laughs> I always oh. love to hear them. <laughs> well, as Danny and Mary and Ari said that, you know, the bulk of the money in the farm bill is going to go to uh, nutrition assistance, really the SNAP program at least 80% of the farm bill, we predict. And there's still gonna be battles around work requirements. We saw some of that in the debt ceiling debate. Uh, some of it will be around how much should SNAP recipients receive. Mm -hmm. uh, the Thrifty Food Plan, which is USDA's calculation about how much benefit people should receive was redone at the start of the Biden administration, appropriately so. I argue uh, an increased on average 40 cents per meal for SNAP beneficiaries. Uh, some people may want to roll that back. Right. Um, there is efforts underway to extend the benefits that were put in place during the pandemic. And those are, that's something I'd like to see. And um, living as I do on a college university campus day to day, uh, there are a lot of issues I'd like to see um, further dealt with in SNAP, including food insecurity among college students, um, particularly parents who right. are trying to manage families and go to school to better their lives and their families' lives. And so anyhow, there's all of that. But um, let me go to your question, Danny, and that is on the non-nutrition stuff in the farm bill. Tom Vilsack, our secretary, my old boss, is out doing a stump speech talking about the 80 plus percent of farmers who are out there struggling and not achieving a livable wage. And I know that's true. That's not fake news. It's mm -hmm. really true because our small scale and many of our um, mid scale farmers aren't making it. And how do we help those people out? How do we use the farm bill to help those people out? 
I was in charge of USDA's budget for the four years when I served as deputy secretary in the, under the Obama administration. People say, oh yeah, that must have been cool, Kathleen. You got to oversee a $150 billion budget, which I did, and it was cool. But during those four years, I had to cut 15% of the budget um, because of economic realities um, that we face. And I learned a real hard lesson there. Anytime you add something new, usually you have to subtract, subtract something old or mm -hmm. you have to do nips and tucks. So as we look at this farm bill and we want to make sure that we help those struggling farmers, many of whom are on important lands that we want to keep in production or at a minimum away from urban development that, right. um, uh, that causes environmental planetary harm, we need to do something different. Yeah, absolutely. Jennifer, you're nodding as well. What do we need to do differently so that we have a farm bill that supports human and planetary health? Yeah, I mean, well, I, I think one of the things we haven't been talking about enough is suburban voters. And, um, you know, a lot of the farm bill, a, a lot of what people don't realize is the farm bill gets voted on. And um, it, it gets voted on by our congressional delegation. There's the House chamber and the Senate chamber. And, and who they're representing um, and what they decide to vote, you know, it, it determines like what they vote on and where the battles and where the battle lines happen and where the fault lines happen. And I, I think enough attention to the suburban voter. And we, we I can very clearly see urban issues that are um, standing out um, in the farm bill. And I can very clearly see the rural issues that, that people are fighting for. But almost no one in food policy or ag policy really knows um, how the suburban voter feels. And so I feel like a lot of the things that are going to swing in and out of the farm bill um, might, might have something to do with that. And so I think we really need to look at the fact that the suburban swing vote um, was really important in the last couple of elections. And we need to go out and we need to talk to these folks about what is it that they support in food and farm policy? Because those those votes are going to matter when it comes to what type of farm bill we get passed and who they think they're representing um, in that farm bill. You know, is it the is it the 12 percent or 13 percent on food assistance? Um, is it the 2 percent of the farming population? Um, and, you know, who's how are we how are we thinking about that as as um, voters and those representing the voters? Thank you so much, Jennifer. Marion, do you want to comment on on sort of who is being represented, maybe? I think that's a, a huge question. Well, the farm bill is about the producers of corn and soybeans. That's what it's been historically. <clears throat> and corn and soybeans are used to feed animals. And these days, 40% of corn goes to fuel automobiles. An astonishing um, development that I think requires um, a lot of critical thinking and is not going to get it in the current political environment. And so you have this historical situation in which the Farm Bill has, has been about big agriculture with capital letters, B-A, big agriculture. And what people have tried to do as a political strategy is to try to get little things in on the margins that are so small that nobody pays any attention to them. There are a few, there are tens of millions or hundreds of millions. They're rounding errors, mm -hmm. trillions that go into the farm bill. And that's a strategy. But what it doesn't do, it's a short-term strategy, or maybe it's a long-term strategy. Uh, but what it doesn't do is try to take the farm bill and look at it and say, does this make sense? Mm -hmm. for the country that we have, for the needs of this country, for the environmental problems that exist, for climate change, for eaters, for farm workers, for all of the people who are constituents of the farm bill. And it's this is a big, complicated problem, and there are many groups that are, have interest in it. The stakeholders are enormous. Everybody is a stakeholder in the farm bill. And I want to know where the advocacy is. I want to see really strong advocacy done by the book, identifying goals, getting people on board with those goals, and working really hard to try to get the kinds of changes that are needed. But the only place I see that kind of advocacy is around SNAP. Right. Uh, I, I do want to come back to SNAP in a little bit, but 
you know, you, you, you mentioned Mary and the changes that are needed and I see a huge opportunity and, you know, you all will correct me if I'm wrong, that the, the farm bill in, in this year provides an opportunity to address the inherent racial inequities of, uh, of our current and past uh, food and agriculture policies. Are we seeing progress on that front? And where are those greatest opportunities to dismantle the barriers that have historically been present for black and brown folks, for food workers, and for others who are, again, who've been historically marginalized? Well, there's a, pro a, a, a place where advocacy is actually doing some good. And the Department of Agriculture is finally, right. reluctantly, foot draggingly, or maybe enthusiastically in this administration, uh, trying to redress some of the historical um, inequities, which are profound, and go back hundred years the or more. Um, again, this is something that advocates have to do. Mm -hmm. These agencies are not going to do this on their own. Congress is not going to do it on its own. The politics of Congress right now, particularly dismal, where the, um, you know, there used to be some opportunity for bipartisan discussion of some of these issues. I'm not sure that's possible mm -hmm. this year. Mm -hmm. um, and the, um, you know, I, as I wrote in my blog post this week, bullying seems to be a very effective technique. <laughs> um, unfortunately. And, unfortunately. And so where are the adults? Where are the political <laughs> leaders? Where is the real, where are people standing up and saying, what can we do that's best for our country? I just don't see that anywhere right now. Mm. I think it's enormously, enormously needed. Thanks, Marion. And it is sad. Where are the adults in these conversations? Adrian, please. Yeah, I would like to chime in on that. Um, I believe the you know, agricultural department is acknowledging, but moving is going to take a lot of time, mm -hmm. right? We didn't get there overnight um, in this inequity and injustice, um, but we need to start moving, right? We have a diverse population and demographics. And we're talking about black, brown, and indigenous rights that have been far, far, far within the violence and history of inequity. And we need to start moving this and it needs to be part of the farm bill. We need to start having these types of discussions now and we need to start having types of movements now to associate. So we're not having this discussion five years or 10 years from now when we do the next farm bill. We have to start addressing these issues of inequity at this point. And I think a lot of it comes down to, again, humanity, right? Again, we're talking about food to the people. We're not talking about food to white people. We're not talking about food to black people. We're talking about food to everyone across the board, class, age, and race. So how do we do this in an equitable way? Um, and what we're finding out is as it, as it's coming from grassroots up, it's just starting to get smaller and smaller into perspective of what's important to the people who are in the House and who are in the Senate that is going to benefit their area without thinking sustainability for everyone, right? So again, like I said, a lot of things that are in this farm bill to me as programs are band-aids and it doesn't create milestones and solutions. And that's what we have to start looking at. And yes, we're going to have to start pulling back on, pulling the curtain back on some of these programs that have just evolved into what we have at this moment mm -hmm. over this 800,000 page bell um, and try not to, you know, again, clean slate it, but really start looking at our issues today and also projecting what our issues are going to be in five or six years. Right. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for all of that. Kathleen, this is your sixth farm bill and you were in leadership at USDA. What kind of progress have you seen on these sort of inherent inequities? Well, easy answer is not enough. Um, you know, when I was at USDA the last time as deputy secretary, I led an effort known as Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food. And some of you may be familiar with, I've seen a lot of friends on the chat, a lot of new people I wanna meet. But part of the notion there was, yes, pushing forward local and regional agriculture, but to me, USDA is one giant black box. 
-hmm. It's 17 programs, hundreds, I mean, 17 agencies, hundreds of programs. How do you even know what's there? And I think sometimes we get this conspiracy theory in our minds that these programs are captured. But I think sometimes it's because certain groups know how to open those doors. Mm -hmm. and they've been opening them year after year. And so part of what I was trying to do with Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food was open USDA's doors wider mm -hmm. and educate a broader swath of the public about what opportunities are at USDA. So I think we have to keep putting pressure on USDA to get rid of the gobbledygook of yeah. um, you know acronyms and really try to show pathways in for, for new groups, number one. Number two, um, and people who know me know I'm becoming crankier and crankier as I <laughs> age, but Not at all. I'm, just, <laughs> I'm just really <laughs> mad that a lot of this money that's been rolling out from the Inflation Reduction Act, from the Infrastructure Act, from the COVID Relief Act is still going out the door in the same old ways. Maybe there's some prioritization put for organizations that are supporting traditionally underrepresented groups, Black farmers, tribal farmers, Native Hawaiian farmers, Alaskan farmers. You know, we can go down the list mm -hmm. of, of people who just haven't gotten a fair share, even based on pure demographic data. But they haven't changed the processes for applying for these grants right. and the timelines for applying for these grants in any significant way. So I'm sitting here at Arizona State University, which is now the largest university in the country. Wow. I got a gazillion research administrators that can help me uh, put together a grant. I put a grant into NSF a couple of weeks ago. It was 245 pages. Yeah. That's what it takes. Yeah. And so you're asking these small organizations with very limited staff, no budgets on a shoestring right. to put forward a grant to USDA um, to compete for this funding. It's impossible. Right. And then USDA hears from people, oh, well, the deadline needs to be extended because these groups can't meet the deadline and they extend it, but you've already lost a month or two months because they hadn't extended it then. So you're just giving the people in the game a little bit longer to polish up their grant. Sure. <laughs> Sure. So, I mean, we need to have a broader concept of equity. It's not just about changing the racial makeup of people in leadership positions or in the career staff. It's about a whole orientation about how we think. And that's where the real failure is and the need is for me right now, because um, when I look at, for example, the big chunk of money that went out for Climate Smart grants last fall, USDA had a pot of money that you could apply for up to 100 million and another pot, pot where you could apply up to 5 million. When you look at the recipients of those grants, uh, I don't really use the words big ag, big food, but, but you've used that. Um, I know people do. Most That's where most of the money went. Right. And that's not, um, that's not what I hope for. That's not really what I need. And and we're giving um, taxpayer dollars to some of the organizations that least need it. Absolutely. And I know the Secretary Vilsack and others in, in at USDA are very proud of those grants. I've heard him talk several times about how proud they are of it. But I do, I, I understand the need to diversify them and to diversify our thinking. And, and I, I loved what you said about getting rid of the gobbledygook of, of jargon with, you know, and, and, and making the process uh, for applying to grants much easier. So needed. Thank you. I do want to shift gears a little bit and go to Ben, and you have mentioned, Ben, that you see this growing interest in, in the opportunities within the agriculture sector to play a role in mitigating the climate crisis. And there are so many, you know, here at Food Tank, we see food as the solution to the climate crisis. Do you see this change among major commodity groups? You know, the, the I can say it, the big ag folks that, you know, who are the recipient of these climate smart agriculture grants? Uh, yeah, and, and, and I'd like to uh, talk about that term a little bit in the climate context, big ag. Uh, to, to me, as someone who's focused on climate change, what that captures to me are the, uh, uh, is the biggest opportunity to reduce emissions are with mm -hmm. the, the big ag crowd, the people who grow most of the food. These are folks we have to be working with, and, 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 if, we, and if we leave them out of the discussion, we're going to be missing a big opportunity to mitigate uh, a, a climate. 
you know, as we, I, I, I think it's really easy, especially on the environmental front, um, but across the board, probably uh, it's just the, the space I work in, it's easy to take a snapshot of an industry in a very narrow way and conceptualize how we would do it better, how it should be done better, how it could be done, and then impose that conceptualization um, onto a, a community as an expectation. We've seen that so many times um, when, when it comes to ag and the environment. Um, and um, and frankly, that is, is why the farm community has flat out opposed environmental policies um, as, a, as a standard for, for decades. It's created this um, division that isn't accomplishing anyone's goals. We're starting to see that shift. And mm -hmm. I think that shift is coming from two factors. First of all, um, increasing risk. It's it's ever increasingly difficult, impossible to ignore what's happening in, a, around us. Costs are increasing, risks are increasing. Weather is um, um, uh, weather events are are um, um, uh, creating a much uh, uh, bigger um, economic problem than producers ever before. So they're um, uh, they're interested, um, uh, but we're also seeing um, the um, the consumer interest grow, which creates a market opportunity. Um, and and so now the ag industry five years ago was not really talking about climate or wouldn't talk about climate. Now they are advocating for climate policy. That's significant. That's a major shift. We should be celebrating that, rewarding, uh, rewarding it, and um, and and working together to see what can really support that ambition even higher. Thank you. I love that Ben is like the positive person on this panel who's talking about celebrating some of the wins that are definitely out there. Jennifer, I want to turn to you though. Yeah, if you're thinking about, you know, talking about sustainability or the climate crisis in the farm bill, does that reduce? To reduce the ability for compromise. Yeah, so I, I actually did want to build on Ben's comments because Please. I think, you know, I, I think we probably aren't going to see a, a greater budget going toward the farm bill, right? We're we're going to be debating sort of where all the dollars go within the farm bill this particular cycle, and so I think, in you know, it's really important that we celebrate the big wins and the big opportunities. And we think about how we can leverage where some of these things are going in order to make uh, make positive change. I mean, one of the things that I've been excited by is maybe seeing that, you know, for a while, sustainability was really a, a sort of considered morality policy and ideological. Mm -hmm. But I think as we've been seeing it shift toward, you know, action, uh, just to shorthand it a little bit, um, we are seeing more debate about, you know, how much is spent on these things and what technically this would look like and, you know, and how this could how this could filter down. And so I think it's really important that that we try to leverage those areas that we can leverage and uh, sort of take out um, some of that ideology. So it is less about, um, you know, creating less compromise and instead creating more opportunity. Yeah. Great, thank you. And I want to come back to you in a second, but before I do, Adrian, you were part of um, the Chefs for Healthy Soil program that the Na uh, Natural Resources Defense Council uh, launched, and it's mobilizing chefs to advocate for regenerative agriculture practices. I'm wondering what you hope to see in the next Farm Bill to support soil health, because in the 2018 Farm Bill, a lot of folks look at at the the use of the term soil health as a turning point um, in in conservation efforts. So, why do you think you know soil health is so important for this next farm bill, and how can chefs be uh, an advocate for that? Soil health is number one, right? We if we don't have this soil health, we are not going to have food. Just make it plain and simple, right? <laughs> Just easy for everyone to understand. And I think that's one thing is like finding the commonality for people to be able to understand what soil health is and why it's important. And as a chef, um, where we get our food from is important to us, um, be, it, be, be it if we call ourselves quote unquote farm to table, which all our food is coming from some type of farm, our, our food is coming from the soil. So soil health is very, very, very important. And I feel, and I hope, uh, chefs will get more involved because we are leaders in the community. We see 
between one to thousands of people a day and just saying one or two comments about our soil health or where our food comes from yeah. can dramatically change the perspective of a guest that comes to really try to understand why it's important for us to have good soil, but maybe also the farm bill itself, or they may be a farmer or know a farmer that needs to get involved with the farm bill. So I find us as chefs, we are large community leaders that can lead the way, but also we have influences within our within our local environment and our local government. Um, we have many of our local and politicians that come to our restaurants right. and we can have these conversations with, and we can be able to translate and have these wonderful conversations and host dinners and bring farmers to the table versus farm to the table to have discussions about what they're growing on their land and why it's important for the community to understand where it comes from and why we need need certain policies and certain programs that will help benefit their community overall. Thank you, Adrian. Jen, I want to come back to you as well as, as Marion and Kathleen. So, you know, the Farm Bill is, is hundreds of pages long. And, you know, I know you try to educate your students and your communities about it. And I'm wondering how how the the use of different kinds of terminology, semantics play into this type of to, uh, of education and how you engage people with the farm bill. So Jennifer, please go first. Yeah. Um, so just to kind of go back to the the suburban vote uh, issue, you know, one of the reasons I started really going down that path was uh, feeling like so many of my students really couldn't see themselves in the farm bill, right? They really thought it was targeted to this pocket of people and this pocket of people. And then once we start, they start learning about the farm bill, they get really excited and they're like, this affects me. Mm -hmm. So I, so I think, you know, the food and ag and community can really start to think about maybe reframing the issues so everyone can see themselves as part of the farm bill. The other thing when I talk to my students is uh, they often feel like this is ominous, right? How can I do anything about this big, gigantic farm bill? It just feels too big for them to tackle. And so, but it opens up the conversation to start talking about kind of upstream and downstream issues to the farm bill. And so we often use that, that individual, um, you know, when you're talking to individuals about nutrition, people often say, uh, knowing what to eat is not enough. You know, you, you have to think about how people can afford food and what the access barriers are to food. And, uh, and I think talking about food policy is the same, right? We can't just talk about the farm bill when the farm bill is up for debate. We yes. have to be thinking upstream and downstream of that. And so the upstream pieces are, you know, do you in the food and ag community know what a marker bill is and how important marker bills are to introducing new ideas to the farm bill? And maybe a new idea doesn't have to be a new idea to Kathleen's point. Maybe it's a new way of implementing something or, um, or a new way, a new process that might open it up to uh, a, a greater number of people, right? Um, I often think we uh, don't think downstream, which is once the farm bill gets passed, often the implementation has to take place. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a great place to, to think about working with agencies who are responsible for implementing and how they can change the processes to open it up to more, um, more, more people and um, to, to doing better things. And so talking to students, you know, you really have to give them that, that, that big picture of like where some of those opportunities are and what would that look like on the ground? And I'll stop there because Kathleen and Marion probably have some, <laughs> some things to add from their experiences as well. Well, and I loved what you had to say that everyone needs to see themselves as part of the farm bill. And that's the reason for the, this um, conversation today. Marion, please. Well, I like to teach students about advocacy. Um, because I think that the farm bill is ripe for advocacy, but it has to be done um, the way advocacy needs to be done, which is to define a very clear goal. Um, and that's not so easy to do with respect to the farm bill, because where are you going to change it? How are you going to take something that's as large as that and start chipping away at it if you don't have the opportunity to do a complete overhaul which is what I think is needed um, and would do if we had a president and a Congress and, um, and a Senate that was interested in what was best for the country and not what was best for the wallets of the um, legislators and the people that they represent. Right. And that's really what we're up against. So if you're advocating for something in the farm bill, your first job is to decide what it is you want to change and who is capable of making that change for you. 
And then you have to go out and organize supporters um, and teach them about why this is this change is important. Mm -hmm. You've got resources. And the, the difficulty with advocacy and with this kind of advocacy is that lobbyists are paid large amounts of money to represent corporate right. interests. Right. And people who are in non-governmental organizations are fighting for resources, um, often among each other, for the same resources. Yeah. Very, very difficult to do. None of this is easy. But I think we need trained community organizers. I think we need people running for office. We need people trying to overturn Citizens United so that and try to get money out of politics. We need some really big changes. And somehow to work on the farm bill in the middle of that, you have to understand where it is you're headed and do everything you can to try to make, make those changes to make it better for everybody and for the planet. I'm an optimist. I think these things are worth working on. Marion, yeah. are you are you an optimist? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have to um, um, interject on 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 this point. Um, I think I think we can all agree if we if we had. Um, um, a president and a Congress that agreed with us, it would, it would be easy to pass a law that we wanted. Uh, uh, the fact is, this is a large bill that impacts every individual in this country. Uh, and and, and that, that means there's a lot of interests in there. And, and I, I, I do believe in our political process, I, that some of the challenges you mentioned are real, that we need to address um, representation issues. Uh, but I also think there are some good people in that city trying to do good work and make people's lives better. Um, and I've been a part of that process in DC. You know, I think it, I think it is uh, defining what you want. Uh, but in this context, we want a lot of things. We want um, uh, we want to address climate change. We want to have better soil, better water, better. Um, um, better community health. We want to improve uh, uh, access to, to, to medicine in, in rural America. We want to improve food access and we want farmers to be um, uh, supported and, and to not be wiped out every time there's a natural disaster. Having all these things work together is the challenging point. And you're going to end up with some policies that aren't perfect. Um, and that isn't a reason to throw those policies in the waste bucket. It's 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 a reason to work on on building them better, uh, building from what you've started with, um, and and overhauling. I think a complete overhaul. You know, I get it, and I would like to do that as well. And I have some ideas on 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 how that should be done. Um, but I think pragmatically, um, it's um, it's uh, it's unlikely. And and chipping away, as um, Mary described it, is um, is uh, only minimalizes the impact some of these small programs have. Uh, if you talk to the producers and the the members of the public who rely on those resources, those are not small programs; they are critical resources. Thanks, Ben. So, Kathleen, please. Yeah, so I think we all think we're smarter than we are, and I put myself in that category. I'm smarter for being a professor in front of smart graduate students. No matter how much I prepare a class, one stinker will ask a question, I'm not ready, <laughs> and I have to go back and do my homework. Um, did we think that in the 1990 Farm Bill, we would get the Organic Foods Production Act um, embedded with the opposition of the House leadership on the Ag Committee, both Democrats and Republicans. Uh, it was the it was a David and Goliath story. When I was deputy secretary and set up the Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food initiative, did I expect there'd be pushback in Congress? You bet, you bet I did. And organized in a way that frustrated the appropriations committees because they couldn't figure out how to write it out of law. We need to be smart. We need to be well-trained. Um, I don't want to be a bummer of a professor and I get fired. Our, our university president says we should all be not faculty members, but solutionaries. Mm. And so I think I, I, I bring in students in the classroom. They're already depressed by climate change and what's going on in the food systems. I don't need to add on a few more layers, right? right. I need to show them pathways about how to be strategic and um, and do good in this world. I see Ami Friedberg is on here from Kansas 
Uh, she's one of my current students now. She did a great report with other students looking at water quality programs that states should be implementing. And that's really important for the state of Arizona where we don't have one. I had a group of students work on a report on um, food metrics at colleges and universities. You know, it's less than four points in AC STARS, which runs uh, through the heads of many college administrators about mm -hmm. um, because they all want a high sustainability rating. And these students exposed it for what it is. It's food is so undervalued, it hardly makes a mark. Right. So what, what I try to do with students is not only educate them about the tools and tactics to achieve food policy reform, but while they're already in the role of student to have some means of pointing to something and say, I did that, that's important, I'm telling the world what I've learned. So I think that's important for all of us professors to allow students to practice while they're, while they're learning or not practice because they're doing more than practicing, they're teaching me, but I right. think that we need to empower them from the very start so that they go off and do greater and greater things and take up from where I've left off. I tried to download what I've learned over the years, but um, you know, I've done a lot of great things in Washington. I've done some not so great things, but I've done a lot of things I'm proud of. But for me, at this point in my career, the most important thing I can do is empower that next gen yeah. leader those next gen leaders and have a whole crowd go out and bring their own ideas and their own energies and their own constituencies to the policy agenda. Thank you, Kathleen. And, and you've been so great at, at sort of, you know, giving us all of this information over the years uh, and, and sharing your torch with, with so many of us to, to do this work. So we appreciate that. I want to thank all the members of this panel for your, your service because you've all been great educators. We all need those strategic pathways that, that Kathleen mentioned so that we feel empowered, not just as students, but as eaters to, to learn more about the Farm Bill and, and to see where we fit in. I do want to use these last 10 minutes for a Q&A from the audience. And so for this first question, I'm just going to combine something that was in the Q&A. There, there's sort of two, two questions that I think uh, fit together. And it's going back to SNAP, which I mentioned earlier, I wanted to come back to. Um, and this is from Chris Wilcox and Andrea Chu, and I'm combining your questions. The first part is how do the new cuts and restrictions to SNAP factor into the Farm Bill? Is there an opportunity to reverse some of the damage? And then Andrea asked, why don't we see more advocacy outside of SNAP? Marion, maybe you want to take this on? Let me unmute here. Um, I, I was fascinated when the bill just got, the spending bill just got passed, that um, some legislators were saying, great, now we don't have to worry about SNAP. The, the deal is done. Uh, we're not going to have to talk about work requirements and SNAP. And other legislatures were saying, wow, we got what we wanted. Now we're going to get more and we're really gonna go after it. Um, and so the, the issue in SNAP is not how can we make sure that we don't have starving Americans, that we're taking care of women and children in this country, that we have enough money in our very wealthy country to make sure that nobody has to go hungry. That's not what's being discussed. What's being discussed is how much money is being spent on this and how can we cut it? Um, without, again, not looking at the bigger picture of what would be best for our country. Um, the question of what to do about the other programs beyond SNAP, you know, and I think that the SNAP advocates are keeping their goals very clear, have formed coalitions and are working as hard as they can mm -hmm. to try to protect the, <clears throat> the people who need that kind of protection. But for the other programs, they're complicated. They're very hard to understand. The, the, the titles are complicated, the details are complicated, and the number of lobbyists who work on them is very, very large. Um, and so it's difficult to arouse, to arouse advocacy, except for some environmental organizations who work on these issues, like um, the one that's represented here, the Environmental Defense Fund, and there is one of the few that is large enough to be able to keep these kinds of things in, in mind and work on them. It's very, very difficult, I think, 
to develop grassroots advocacy around issues that you can't understand or that seem quite remote. That's why SNAP is in the farm bill. Right is because it brings in these, these completely diverse interests and plays them off against each other and says, I'll, ta- I'll pass mine if you'll pass, you know, I'll pass yours if you'll pass mine. Um, and that's the strength and the weakness of the farm bill and makes it just immensely compl- complicated. Thank you, Mary. Does anyone else wanna comment on that question around SNAP? and you know things beyond snap that we should be advocating for <laughs> don't well, jump in <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in on that second point uh, that was pretty open um op- op- opening i agree with a lot of what um um uh, marion just said though um uh, <laughs> we can agree sometimes um <laughs> Uh, I think this um, the the point of climate is such a major opportunity, and it's also something that we can't afford to miss right now. Right. Uh, uh, we we've known about climate change for a while, but we're at the, the point where action has to take now. If we're it, at, be taken now, if we're going to be able to meet even our um, uh, you know com, uh, uh, baseline expectations of how low we can uh, keep the temperature from from rising. But this situation is different because uh, uh, while in the past we had kind of the ag industry working against us or at least not working with us on this front, that has shifted. And and now you're seeing um, uh, climate activists in the farm community asking for policies, asking for support. Um, And that's allowed us to um, increase ambition, but we have a lot of ways to go. Um, We have some funds on the table from the Inflation Reduction Act. We have to spend those well. We have to spend them wisely, and we have to use uh, part of that money to build our data, research, science um, that will build a better foundation for everything we're doing. So that's just one opportunity that um, I think we have to keep talking about. Great, thank you. Go ahead, Kathleen. Just one quick thing, because it was a question in the Q and A. Uh, so the Child Nutrition Act reauthorization. So we have this farm bill that happens every five years, but we're supposed to have this other big thing that happens every five years or so, which is about our primarily our school meals, but other things, child nutrition it is way past due, like over 10 years past due. And uh, Congress never seems to get around to it. So the big question in the farm bill is, does some of that stuff um, come, should it be swept into a farm bill? Because we're losing hope that we're gonna get child reauthorization despite promises to the contrary. I also wanna quickly address a question that came in the chat, is NRCS funding included in the farms bill? Absolutely, that's when we refer to conservation. Mm -hmm. We're primarily talking about NRCS and not only is it in the farm bill, but it got a huge chunk of money in the Inflation Reduction Act for climate. When we talk about climate, um, a lot of that money is through existing programs like the EQIP program, um, that's where people are hoping climate change advancements will occur. So um, lots of money there right now. It's so much so that NRCS is a little overwhelmed because they've been under a uh, hiring freeze. And now all of a sudden they've got billions to spend and they're trying to figure out how to do it. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, I just want to make sure that we get to at least one more question. And this is from one of Food Tank's board members, so I have to ask it. (laughs) Regina Anderson asks, what is the opinion of the panelists on what the Farm Bill encompasses? Do we need provision provision slash funding that are represented, um, that that is in it that are represented elsewhere so as not to be so onerous? Uh, this is the important part of the question. I'm sorry I butchered it a little bit, uh, Regina. It's hard to ask the public to feel that they can have a voice on a document that is not created with them in mind. So Adrian and Jennifer specifically, if you could, you know, sort of uh, address that. How how do we get people <laughs> to, to be behind something that they don't feel a part of? And I know we've been talking about how we all should feel a part of the Farm Bill, but it's very difficult. It is very difficult, you know, stumbling on the farm bell, you just don't Google it, you know, right. as a normal person, you just don't go, what is the farm bell? Um, you know, it has a lot to do with having these conversations, but also making it palatable and understandable and ironically digestible, right? Because this is a very large bell. And one thing, and Jen said it earlier, was about 
the communication and transparency across the board. It's just the regular person, but it's also the big companies, right? right? We need to all ironically come to the table and really understand what this farm bill is about. And when you look at it, it is going to be about everyone. Everyone is a person and we're sitting and looking at the food and we're looking at the cause and we're looking at the solution. And, and like, again, putting a Band-Aid on to say five years, we're going to look at it again is not going to work because it has put us in this situation time and time and time again. And now here we are using different words, uh, different branding, not saying climate change, you know, saying good soil, but not really getting to the point. And the point is, is are we going to survive in five years, right? Are we doing enough to let us survive and be sustainable for the future? And is our earth going to survive at the same time, right? So again, you know, we can talk about an equity and social justice issues, but across the board, it's affecting all of us. It's affecting all of us in some which, some way. So yes, we need to start having boards that include the regular person, but also larger companies. We all need to have these conversations because we all come from different perspectives and there's a lot of privilege that doesn't understand what exactly is happening when it trickles down, when this money comes all the way down to put food in the hands of someone or to put seeds into the ground. They do not understand or don't have that perspective. So getting up and being able to one, raise the money to be able to take a farmer to go lobby or to have a conversation with somebody who is sitting behind a desk, making money or working with lobbyists. How do they translate their issues and what's happening on the ground on a day-to-day -day basis that they're leaving work, not making money to come have this right. conversation with you? How is that supposed to translate? How are they supposed to get that perspective? So I believe sometimes they need to come from behind the desk and go to them and really see Absolutely. what the lived experiences of their constituents are, are what's happening to them and really understanding on a day-to-day -day basis what's going on. And, and, I, and, not just, and not just from the White House and not just from DC, but these larger companies where they're getting their food from, not from the vendor, but down to the farmer and who is it really affecting? And then how does it get to be where we get to food is medicine? And how does it get to where we say climate change is a real issue? Thank you, Adrian. Jennifer, we are out of time, but you have 30 seconds. Oh God, sorry, to give, no, I'll give you 30 seconds to, to sort of sum up what your, your thoughts are. I think the power of food is, it's a story of hope and celebration, right? And, and, Instead of, um, there is a battleground here, of course, but uh, you know, when I hear Adrian talking about some of these dinners and, and bringing together farmers and eaters and celebrating the food and the food ways um, over time, you know, that's the power of food. And I think that's what we need to tap into. I love it. What a wonderful point to end on, Jennifer. I can't thank you enough. I can't thank all of our panelists enough for your time and your expertise. Thanks to all of you who are able to join us. The, the recording will be available on our podcast as well as on our YouTube channel. Thank you all so much and, and keep that positivity going and um, looking forward to what this farm bill brings. Thanks again, everyone.